Good evening and welcome to Watertown Theater. I'm Chuck Burney, Artistic Director of the Royal Victorian Opera Company. We've been focusing on a series of six musical entertainments that William Gilbert wrote for German Reed's Gallery of Illustration in the period from 1869 to 1875. Last year we brought you Eyes and No Eyes, which is the last of the series. Tonight we're bringing you No Cards, which is the first member of the series, and as such it's a transitional work. Gilbert had not yet quite found the voice that distinguished him as a major playwright of the Victorian era. A number of playwrights of the period could have written No Cards or something very much like it. But only Gilbert, as he matured into a master craftsman, could give us something as witty and intricate as eyes and no eyes. One sign that this is a transitional work is the fact that Gilbert was not yet working with a single composer. Although the score that we're using from 1901 attributes the music to Lionel Elliot, nobody really knows who Lionel Elliot was, and we know for sure that German Reed himself wrote the music to the song Babbity Boobledore, Alfred Lee composed Champagne Charlie, and if you listen carefully, you'll hear snatches of Yankee Doodle appearing in the ensemble. The plot concerns a beautiful young heiress who's being wooed by two bachelors, one of them old and wealthy, the other one young and poor, and I won't spoil it for you by telling you now which one succeeds. At the end of the play, Mrs. Pennythorne hands the successful suitor a suggested wedding announcement, which ends with the phrase, no cards. The Victorians observed the milestones of their life, births, weddings, and funerals, by putting announcements in the paper. Occasionally, or often, tradespeople would follow up on the announcement and drop in and pay a call and try to persuade them to buy, say, a cradle or a set of silverware or a casket, and they would leave their business card. So to avoid this annoyance, the announcements would frequently end with the phrase, no cards. I should mention one more thing, and that concerns the name of the wealthy bachelor, LSD. To modern ears, it sounds like a reference to the hallucinogenic chemical that was popular in the 1960s. But this chemical was not discovered until the 1950s. To the Victorians, LSD would signify the abbreviation for pounds, shillings, and pence, and thus label Mr. D as Mr. Moneybags or something like that. We've had a lot of fun working on this show, and we hope you enjoy watching it.
I much prefer the songs of the music halls. Yes, there's something so very jolly about them. Mucky taught me one last week. All ready to London. Could you sing it for me? Yes, I can. And I will. We'll have an ear for music. A uh, husband? Who? I've seen too many unhappy marriages to fall into that trap. My dear Annabella, I have lived a lot longer than you have, and I've seen a great deal more of the world. Believe an experienced old woman when she says that for every one unhappy marriage, there are at least a hundred happy ones. It's fast fashion of the day, my dear, to sneer at married life, and fast fashions are always wrong in principle. Those people who ridicule the idea of marriage do not realize how much they owe the institution. No girl who places a value upon her existence should turn up her nose at the institution to which she's indebted for it. <laughs> I don't sneer at marriage in the abstract. Oh, I sneer at marriage with an old bachelor like Mr. Ellis D. Bachelor? Why, what in the world would a girl want to marry but a bachelor? I said old, Oz. Old? A boy, 50 on the very outside. But as rich as he is, I do not press Mr. LSD upon you. Marry whomsoever you like, so that you do like him, but marry somebody. That's my advice to everyone. Marry somebody. Do you know, Aunt, I often wonder how it is that you, whose personal experiences of married life have certainly not been fortunate, should nevertheless be so enthusiastic a matchmaker. You say that 99 marriages out of 100 turn out happily. Certainly in your case. My dear, mine was the hundredth. Someone's has to be the hundredth. Bless me if I'm run over by a Pickford's van on Fleet Street. Is that any reason why you should never go east of Charing Cross? Nonsense. My marriage was a miserable one, and, well, my misfortunes have made me more keenly alive to the happiness I might have enjoyed had I married anybody else. <laughs> Mr. Coodle was a bad man. A thorough scamp, my dear, and three weeks after we were married, he ran away, and I've neither seen nor heard of him since. So I've resumed my maiden name, and I've washed my hands of him forever. You 
It was too bad of Aunt Salamanca to make such a man my guardian. I can't marry without his consent. And as he hasn't been seen for twenty years, I suppose I shall have to remain single all my life. Single? With twenty-five thousand pounds? Nonsense, my dear. Why, all we have to do is tell the Lord Chancellor that Mr. Coodle, your guardian, is a bad character and has run away. And his lordship will adopt you on the spot. That's what he's paid for. But why do you object to Mr. D? He's a very wealthy man. But he's so old, aunt, and so dreadfully rich. And such a terrible storyteller. You can't believe a word he says. I don't pretend to be a Scotland Yard detective. <laughs> but then, on the other hand, I'm not the Royal Regiment of Marines. <laughs> well, there is Mr. Churchmouse. He's poor and not, not conscious, and he doesn't tell any stories. But he's so terribly shy, Aunt. He couldn't be more nervous than speaking to me if I were both Houses of Parliament rolled into one. I have my faults, but I'm not the House of Commons. <laughs> but all oh, that will wear off, my dear. Look at him when he plays in amateur performances. He's as self-possessed as possible, then. Yes, it's very curious. Whenever he is dressed for a part, his nervousness seems to vanish immediately. All that is attributable to an unnecessarily keen sense of his own personal defects. Mr. Churchmouse is so ashamed of Mr. Churchmouse that he's delighted to appear as anybody else. It's a very good sign in a young man, my dear. I only wish it were a more common one. A great deal of experience in life I've had. Remember when you come across a shy young lad. He's a rarity, so cultivate him if you can. Have a very high opinion of a shy young man. A timid and a bashful and a shy young man. A nervous and an awkward and a shy Miss Penrose, your fresh young voice is in splendid condition today. Come, encore. No? Well, well, perhaps not. We don't do to overexert the voice, Miss Penrose. Talking of encores, I remember hearing the famous Russian singer Mademoiselle Shrieker at the Scala many years ago. Enormous sensation she made. Encored in Robertois que j'aime 57 times in one performance. It lasted two days and three nights. The band were carried out one by one as they dropped from their stools until no one was left but the triangle who held out like a man. She married him now. He founded the celebrated Euclid concerts. Euclid concerts? Yes, nothing but triangles. Very popular in the provinces, especially with three cornered constituencies. Hello, who's this? Mr. Churchmouse. Found Churchmouse. He's always here. Yes, we are getting up some private theatricals, and Mr. Churchmouse is assisting us. What? Churchmouse, an actor? Oh, <laughs> I assure you that with all his nervousness and timidity, he's a very capital actor. Here he is. Good morning, Miss Penrose. Oh, Mr. Churchmouse. 
Thank you. <laughs> How do you do today? Well, thank you. I'm quite well. I'm much obliged to you. Why, I'm wonderfully well for me. How do you do, Mr. Dean? I hope you're well, sir. I hope you're well. Well, no. You see, it's this terrible tooth of mine. I haven't had a week of sleep this week. Oh, Miss Penrose, I have such a toothache. <gasps> well, Mr. Churchmouse, you said you were so well. I am well, wonderfully well. Thank you. Gardening, Miss Penrose? Uh, yes, I am planting double stocks. Ah, uh, Miss Penrose, I often wish I was a double stock. Indeed. Why? Uh, to be born double instead of having to achieve doubleness. Especially if one might choose one's partner beforehand. Uh, like the Siamese twins? No, sir, not at all like the Siamese twins. I'm referring, sir, to marriage. I wish I was born married, that's what I mean. Oh, so do I, sir. Don't you, Miss Penrose? Don't I what? Which Mr. D had been born married. Sir! Uh, such an economy, Miss Penrose. Uh, one branch for the marriage and the christening. One announcement in the Times for both events. Something thus. On the 1st of April, 1780, Mrs. D, that's your mama, you know, of a son to Julia, the only daughter of Theophilus Brown of Nova Scotia, no cards. <laughs> there would be one advantage attached to not being born married, to being born married. There would be no occasion for any guardians. Now, I have a guardian who hasn't been heard of for 20 years. And I can't possibly marry without his consent. And is it possible, Miss Penrose, that, that the disposal of such a prize is in the hands of a man who hasn't been heard of for 20 years? His name, his name. Um, he is Mrs. Pennythorne's husband. Mrs. Pennythorne's husband. I pledge myself to discover Pennythorne within the next two hours. Ah, uh, but his name isn't Pennythorne. It's Coodle. Ah, well then, allow me to undertake, uh, undertake the discovery of Coodle. Nonsense, sir. I have already undertaken ah, to discover Pennythorn. <laughs> and if a picture of the gentleman shall assist you to discover him, I think I can find ah, one. A picture. The very thing. Yes. It's considered a wonderful likeness. Hmm, I see. Hmm. A, a Negro gentleman, I presume? Oh, no. Only a very black character. Uh, but not as black as he's painted, we'll hope. What? Well, Miss Penrose, don't allow the matter to worry you any further. In half an hour, Coodle shall... Hey, Vaughan, sir. Coodle, sir. Coodle. <laughs> In half an hour, Coodle shall be here. If I don't produce him, call me a blatant imposter. Oh, I will, sir. I will. With pleasure. From this pretty bower hence I depart and stand her. If I don't earn our hands, beat him in a canter. Rose devoid of any thorn, christen me a new lord. You discover penny thorn, I'll discover cool. Pooh, pooh, penny thorn. Cool, oodle, oodle. Oh, there's no Mr. Penny thorn, it's cool. Oh, 
Sometimes. He has a certain amount of intelligence. Oh, I would say Mr. D is a very intelligent man. With all his faults, I would say he is very clever. I would call Mr. D a clever man, a decidedly clever man. Oh, come, Mr. Churchmouse, with all your good nature, you must admit that his conversation is terribly vapid. You know it is. It really is. Oh. Almost idiotic sometimes. For a man of his age, he's not at all bad looking. No, Mr. D, he is a handsome man. I would call Mr. D a very handsome man. But that unfortunate nose. Well, his nose is ugly. And an ugly nose is fatal to a face. You don't know his own mind for a minute together. It's true, I don't know as I have ever met a more vacillating person. Mr. Church Mouse. Oh, it's my list. Your list? My, my program. Your program? Yes. Uh, whenever I'm going on to make calls, I, I, I create a list of subjects of conversations. Oh. That way I may never be uh, at um, a loss. Oh. <laughs> may I look at it? Oh, certainly. Mm. The Return of Jews to Palestine. Doctrines of Confucius. Manhood suffrage? New rule for finding the parallax of fixed stars? The Talmud? Good cure for corns. Yes, these are all subjects on which I feel very strongly. Very strongly indeed. Between you and me, Miss Penrose, this is the secret to my reputation for being an agreeable rattle. These are the only subjects on which I may be said to have thoroughly made up my mind. Well, Miss Penrose, I must be off. Oh, but I will be here directly. Oh, uh, yes, I wanted to see her about those theatricals, but I'm supposed to be to Papa Thomas half a mile away by now. Uh, but I haven't a moment to lose. Good morning, Miss Penrose. Good morning. A strange gentleman? Let me see his card. That's just it, ma'am. I asked him for his card, and he refused to give me one. And he particularly mentioned that he wished to see you alone. Oh, how very mysterious. Well, show him in, Seymour. Very good, ma'am. My dear aunt, you'll surely never admit a stranger who refuses to give any account of himself. <clears throat> My dear Annabella, I have been married to the worst character on the face of this earth, and after that I am not easily terrified. I am a weak, defenseless woman by law, but I am quite equal to any man I have ever met. And besides, perhaps his name is a comical one, and he's ashamed of it. I'm sure when I was Mrs. Coodle, I never gave my name except on compulsion. Oh, here he comes. And a bad face, my dear. But never mind, go away. I am quite equal to this emergency. Well, sir, who are you and what do you want? Oh, then it is as I said, and you don't know me. I go. Bless the man. Know you how should I know you? True, how should you? Ah, oh, man, many changes have taken place since we met. One change, at least. I, ma'am, have altered a great deal for the better. You have altered a great deal for the worse. <laughs> I am comparatively younger than I was. You are positively older than you were. I have grown a beard. You have not. Bless the man. Be more explicit, do. Who in the world are you? Who am I? Pardon, Miss Tear. It's a passing weakness. Who am I? 
To explain that, I must ask you to carry your memory back nearly a quarter of a century. A quarter of a century? Yes, ma'am. Do you think you can charge your memory with events that took place so long ago? Well, really, my mind is a very good one, but a quarter of a century is a long while. True. So it is. That never occurred to me. It is a long while. You must have forgotten the circumstance to which I was going to allude. Forgive me, ma'am, my girl. Uh, pray stop. What is the circumstance you allude to? A mere trifle, ma'am. You happen to remember a very cold January morning, nearly a quarter of a century ago, at, at St. George's, at quarter past eleven o'clock in the morning, at St. George's Hanover Square, you... But no, impossible, it must have escaped you, I go. Now do stop, go on. If I stop, I can't go on. If I go on, I can't stop. <sighs> well, ma'am. Do you remember that on a cold January morning, nearly a quarter of a century ago, you were married to a gentleman named... But no, you must have forgotten it. To a person named Coodle? Perfectly. Is it wonderful? Is it possible? Wonderful old lady. I was Mr. Coodle's best man. Mr. Coodle was a very bad man who ran away three weeks after we were married, and I've neither seen nor heard of him since. He was a boy, ma'am, a mere boy. He ran away with all my money. He was such a creature of impulse. And although he made a large fortune at the diggings, he never refunded one penny of my property. Boys will be boys. Come, come, don't be too hard upon him. He intends to make you ample compensation. Intends, sir? Why, what in the world do you know of him? Ma'am, prepare yourself for a surprise. I bring a message from him. He and I landed at Southampton last night, and he has sent me on to say that within a course of the day, or two at farthest, he will be with you. Oh, indeed, Mr. D. Well, if he evinces any signs of sincere sorrow, I may perhaps be induced to forgive him. But what is his special object in returning? Ma'am, I won't deceive you. You can't, sir. But I wouldn't if I could, without saying a great deal. His special object in returning is to confer the hand of his niece and ward, Miss Annabella Penrose, on a highly eligible young gentleman of property living in this neighborhood, a, a Mr. B or C or D. D. That was the name. A Mr. D. Do you happen to know him? Oh, certainly. A most undesirable acquaintance for any young lady. What? Oh, one of the worst characters in the county, sir. But we tolerate him because I knew his poor father. And besides, we are a very good-natured people. But I never met a man more universally disliked. Oh. Ah. And does Annabella dislike him? Dislike him? Well, she detests him. Well, he's very rich. <laughs> Oh, my dear sir, he has a depressed fall that he can call his own. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know the Royal Indelible Bank, which holds his securities and deposits to a value of 32,000 pounds. Yes, yes. That is, uh, I've heard of it. Well, I have heard that they have stopped payment. <sighs> and not only that, but you know the Atmosphere Castle Building Company Limited, in which he had invested all his spare capital, well, they're on the eve of winding up. <sighs> I sent word round to tell him, but he wasn't at home. Good gracious, is it possible? I must see about this. But your niece, ma'am, has money. Oh, 25,000 pounds. Just so. Well, remember, Mr. Coodle has sent me to say that she is to marry Mr. D under any circumstances, rich or poor, rich or poor. My man is Coodle's owner. I'm going to see Mr. D and tell him the happiness in store for him. Good morning, ma'am. You devil call me atmospherics, man out! Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, it's my tooth! <laughs> I'll show you, Mr. D, but I haven't done with you yet. Another refuses to send in his cards. Oh, the fashion of no cards is extended from weddings to morning calls. But never mind. Send him in, Seymour. Very good, ma'am. Some nonsense of church mouses all be bad. Hm. Oh, and as I live, it is, Mr. Church Mouse. Good morning, madam. I come on a sweet errand of mercy. Madam... You are rich. Others are poor. You are in complete control of your senses. Others are not. You have the enjoyment of a valuable set of limbs. Others, unfortunately, are short of the proper complement. Yeah. I, madam, and may you behold 
the channel of communication, the conduit pipe, if I may so express myself, between the wealthy, the wise, and the well-made, on the one hand, the destitute, dute, the delirious, and the disjointed, on the other. You represent uh, some charity, I presume? Oh, I, I, I represent no individual charity. I am not of those who make invidious distinctions. Rather, I am the universal agent for all the charities in Great Britain and Ireland. I deal rather with a broad concept of charity than with its details. Hmm, I see. You look upon it in the abstract. Oh, very much so indeed, ma'am. Still, at the same time, you are quite at liberty to decide whether you want your half-crown crown devoted to any particular institution, or whether you should like it distributed among the 867 charities of Great Britain and Ireland. The truly charitable usually consider the latter course, for their names being written 867 times on 867 uh, pieces of paper, they have the opportunity of creating, uh, setting 867 good examples at a very moderate outlay. Uh, I am an elemosinary pillar post. Post four half crowns in this waistcoat pocket, and don't trouble yourself any more about it. You will never hear of it again. Well, I, I haven't my purse with me, but you can ask the servant for half a crown. The housemaid, that is, not the man. Do you have a housemaid, then? Certainly. Ah, well, then allow me. The humble housemaid's happy home. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> housemaids are taught that postmen are pitfalls and bakers a snare for abomination. A curious charity. Mm, but a highly valuable one. A young woman, a housemaid, comes to our home and confesses that she is in love with a baker. Do we dismiss her on that account? Oh, no. We are all love. We... We throw into a society of butchers. We... Tell if we read her... Songs in praise of the butcher's life. We read her little tracts like... Bakers as they are, butchers as they might be. We sing her little songs like... Chomp, chop, Charlie is my name. And... Come and will dismember little frolicking lambs until the very soul is impregnated with the poetry of the butcher's life. And she marries the butcher. Uh, oh dear, no. We then proceed to disgust her with butchers the way we disgusted her with bakers. Rem um, fl uh, flooding her, so to speak, with postmen, reminding her that postmen alone knock double knocks while all other tradesmen single knocks. And we draw from this a moral that the emblem of the knock is a, that the knock is an emblem of the institution for which she is most fitted. Um, after flooding her with postmen, we uh, then turn on a supply of grocers, green uh, grocers, men, uh, policemen, and uh, milkmen, um, showing her the shallowness of each class of future in turn. And leading to the stock moral of our establishment that all men are vanity. Your name, madam, that I may emblazon it on the 867 charities that I have the honor to represent. Well, my name is Pennythorn, but you needn't trouble yourself to print it. Not Pennythorn? Impossible. Oh, that's my name, sir. Not. Uh, no, it can't be. Sir? <laughs> That you, you can't be the Frederica Pennythorn. Now, Poodle, whom I married thirty years ago. Twenty. Two, twenty. Uh, at St. James's Church, Hanover, P Piccadilly. Hanover's. Ah, true, it was Hanover. Uh, um, on one lovely July day. January? True, it was January. Uh, it's the same thing. No, your argument is ingenious, but it won't do. What does the man mean? In man? That you are not the Frederica Pennythorn, now Poodle, whom I've been sighing for for the past twenty years in the backwoods of North America? West Australia. True, it was West Australia. No, no, uh, you cannot... <sighs> um, your argument is very convincing, and you have conquered. The prize is yours. Oh, you are, Coodle, are you? Well, you have arrived rather early. Your friend said that you wouldn't be here till tomorrow or the next. My friend said that? Oh, yes. Uh, he brought your message. He brought my message? Oh, this is extremely awkward. Yes, sir. Uh, he just left, and he'll be back directly. 
Well, yeah. Uh... Ah, your message was hardly necessary, for Mr. Coodle has arrived. Oh, Coodle's arrived, has he? Yes, this is Mr. Coodle, and uh, I shall go fetch Annabella so that he and she can fight it out. <laughs> uh, how do you do, Coodle? Uh, how do you do? I, uh, I hope you gave my message. Oh, yes, I gave your message. I hope you gave it word for word. Oh, yes, it's word for word. It's particular importance that it be given word for word. It might help me a bit if I knew what the message was. <sighs> Sir, this is not a time for ceremony. Are you or are you not, Mr. Coodle? I must brazen it out. Oh, yes, I am Mr. Coodle. Are you sure you are Mr. Coodle? Sure? Why, one can never be sure of anything. Uh, uh, but I have an impression. An impression, sir, is not enough. This man is an imposter. What should you say, sir, if it turned out that I was Mr. Cool? I should say that was a remarkable instance of mistaken identity on my part. He is an imposter. I knew he was. Well, sir, I am Mr. Coodle. You are? I am. Oh, well, then, sir, frankly, I must say I was mistaken. I was misled by a, a, a remarkable resemblance. Uh, we are wonderfully alike, don't you think? This is getting extremely awkward. But what could have been your object in assuming my name, sir? Well, I'll be honest with you. It was to save you the trouble of giving your consent to marriage to uh, a dear friend of mine, one church mouse, with your ward, Annabella Penrose. Ch church mouse, sir? Nothing of the kind, sir. I had, int had intended her from her earliest childhood for my worthy old friend, Mr. D. Mr. D? Well, just between the two of us, sir. Uh, Mr. D is not the kind of uh, gentleman for a fine young lady, you know. He's a decent fellow, poor chap. But, you know, he's... You know, oh, D isn't quite right there, isn't he? Oh, right? Why, he's as mad as a hatter. Why, rabid! Why, he's been three times in an insane asylum. You astonish me. He seems quite quiet. Mm, that's his cunning. He's all right until sunset, and then the paroxysms begin, and they last until daylight. Awful, isn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. I've known that young man since we were so long, sir, I never had the slightest idea of this. Young man? He's 50. Nonsense, sir. 35. Well, you know the song about the uh, old men who proposed to marry. No, I don't, sir. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. An elderly person, a prophet by trade, with whips and whips on withered old lips. He married a young and a beautiful maid, this shocking old maid, no rather decayed. Married a young and a beautiful maid. Acquaintances bidden and bad with loud hijinks and underbred wings. The thought they'd a family have, but they had a singular lad who drove them half mad, who returned out of for a horribly fast little man. For when he was born, he astonished all by who the oh dear me did ever you see? He'd a weed in his mouth and a glass in his eye, his hat all awry, an octagon tie, and a miniature, miniature glass in his eye. Rumbled at wearing a frock and a cap with his arm in out and hang it, you know. And he turned up his nose at his excellent cap. My friends, it's a map and I'm not with a tap. Now, this was a remarkably excellent cap. His father, a pleasant old gentleman, he with nursery rhyme. And once on a time, he told him the story of the little OP. So pretty was she, so pretty and we, as pretty as pretty as pretty can be. But the babe with a dig would startle and ox with a truth who laughed who long was his mind would explain and the freight was sucking old fox. Now a father it shocks and it whitens his locks when his little babe calls him a shocking old fox. He early determined to marry and wife for better or worse with his elderly nurse. The poor little babe didn't live to contrive. His health didn't thrive. No longer alive, he died in an old dotard at five. Now elderly men, a 
of the bachelor crew with wrinkled hose and spectacled nose. Don't marry at all, you may take it as true. If ever you do the steps, you will rule. For your babes will be elderly, elderly too. Shall do for the tiger, and you can hang the boa constrictors on the umbrella stand in the hall. How do you do? How do you do? Don't know me, do you? Take off your hat. That's really mad. Take off your hat. You are in the presence of royalty. Of royalty? Yes, I am the Queen of Gravity Boobledore. Oh, my geography is rather shaky. Be knighted. You have no idea where it is. It's an island off the Indian archipelago. I hope you found the climate agreeable, ma'am. Very. Then why leave it? I have come to cultivate amicable relations with Great Britain, and as a first step I have called upon my dear friends Mr. and Mrs. Coodle. Ah, but they are not amicable relations. They haven't spoken in twenty years. No matter, sir. My people are in a very unhappy condition. Oh, I can quite believe that. The dawn of civilization has not yet been broken upon them, and I have undertaken to tame them. They couldn't be in better hands. But may I ask, are you a native? No, I am a native of Great Britain, I'm ashamed to say. The feeling is mutual, ma'am, I'm sure. Twenty years ago, I was wrecked on the island. Their queen had just died, and the selection of a successor was being carried on by competitive examination. It was a question of physical strength, and I won. Congratulations, ma'am. I, I, I... Don't be ridiculous. They elected me their queen. Benighted ignorance. Some people never know when they are well off. <laughs> Benighted? You're right there. You have no idea of the depths of in ignorance into which my unhappy people is plunged. They have positively no sense of propriety. Listen, and I'll tell you all about it. You ask me what species of people I met in Babbity Boobledore. There are very in Babbity Boobledore. They live in a foolishly simple way, and whatever they happen to think, they say, Oh, pity the ignorant dog is free of a Babbity Boobledore. Babbity Boobledore. The Babbity it seems to thrive in Babbity Boobledore. The ignorant savages rise at five in Babbity Boobledore. They breakfast at seven, at two they dine, and the gentlemen never sit over their wine. So everybody's in a bed by nine in a Babbity Boobledore.
dear Coodle, I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry for you. <laughs> you, Coodle? I thought you said you were Coodle. Did, did I say so? That's so like me. A absence of mind, my dear madam. Yes, this is Coodle. Poor, poor Coodle. No! Nonsense! Mr. Coodle is more than two and twenty! More than two and twenty? More than two and fifty? Hello, church mouse. I hope Coodle. Coodle's a nonsense. But why do you want to shoot him? Because he has forged my burial certificate and also my will. Then you are... Salamanca Trombo! Now go along, you're dead. Am I? No, I apologize! <laughs> Banana Bella Penrose has not 25,000 pounds. Not 25,000 pence. Mm. Poor little thing, how young she looks. And I, how old I look. It would be too bad, after all, to grasp such a tender young rosebud on such a tough old oak as I. No, I'd be magnanimous. Miss Penrose, you have had a narrow escape. You love me, but I will not take advantage of your youth and inexperience. I resign you. You are too young for me. Too young for what, Uncle? Uncle? Oh, of course, I forgot. Yes, Uncle, to be sure. <gasps> Mr. Mr. L.C. Yes, odd, isn't it? <laughs> yes, Miss Penrose, I am sorry for you, but you are too young for me. But not too young for me. Nor too poor? Nor too poor. Nor too poor, unless 25,000 pounds is insufficient. Mrs. Pennyford! Yes, Mr. Churchmouse, it is I. And I have great happiness in giving you this autograph of mine, in hope and belief that you will want it before long. At St. Stickleback's, collected him by the sea by the Reverend Charles von Highfly? Peter, only son of the late Solomon Churchmouse, to Annabella, only daughter of the late Sir Peter Penrose of Penrosery Penrith. No, no cards! <laughs> <laughs> As far as with me it remains, you'll never see Coodle more. Never see Coodle more. Without under penalty, penance and pain, you'll never see Coodle more. Never, never see Coodle. Our Coodle and I, we could never agree. Let that be our lesson to each of the three. Take warning, my dear Annabella, from me. I'll never see Coodle more. Never see Coodle more. Never see Coodle more. Our Coodle and she. Never agree that I'd be a lesson to each of us three. Her tell 